I think Trump is underestimated. We've talked about this before. Yep. Um, I think he's going to win in a lot of places that people aren't suspecting. Uh, part of his appeal is the fact Trump is Trump. He may say some things that for people in my world we find offensive. Oh my God, he's burning the Constitution. This is so, like, not what the norm of what society should be. Burning the Constitution and meanwhile, over COVID, and meanwhile, however, is in, okay. you know, in middle America, in a lot of places that you know, folks weren't voting, in a lot of blue-collar America, they see that as, my God, he's finally challenging the system and he's doing something. Welcome, I'm John Caldera, president of the Independence Institute and your devil's advocate. You know him, you love him, you love to hate him. The uh, brains behind the leftist takeover of Colorado, the reason why our lives suck. My good friend, Ted Trippa. Good to see you again. Great to be here. Um, so, uh, you're still alive. Uh, of course, thank God for such things at the stay-at-home order, which is helpful. Really? Yeah. See, I figured there'd be some progressives out there who go, this is too far. This is too much authoritarianism. Well, no, I would prefer to stay alive. You can still stay alive. But how do you know? You could have asymptomatic people walking around, giving it to people, and the next thing you know, it spreads to one, spreads to four, spreads to eight, whatever that exponential so, thing is. So the, the house arrest didn't bother you at all? No. No, well, seriously, it didn't. You got a nice house, so that's one part of it. Well, thank God for that, because there's yeah. two of us, and you know, when it yeah, doesn't you go have... so well, you can go to one end and the other end. Yeah, I got kids. So, um, one, um, you get every bit of my sympathy. Yeah, I will it, say that. it's, it's been a long, it's been a long shutdown. There have been a lot of us who found this whole thing mind boggling. Um, yeah, we understand the fear. We understand stay at home, but that unelected officials such as Tri-County Health can put people under house arrest and, and shut down an economy that scares the hell out of me. Well, first of all, one, I would challenge the term house arrest. It's not house arrest. Two, how often... How about have, house arrest how, without due process? How, how often have we had a true imminent public health threat? Last you one, know, big one was 1969 with the uh, Hong Kong flu, which killed twice as many people. Well, we got smarter. You know, so uh, so you, you want a little bit more freedom so twice as many people can die? Come on, John. You know, people also die because they're stuck at home, they're losing their jobs, they're fighting depression, fighting suicide, their spousal well, they, abuse, They all may die things. because of that, but they're not going to be three other people die because they had the virus, went out and infected them. So it doesn't bother you that unelected officials can um, do this? I will say it does bother me that unelected officials are doing it. I, I can see the argument around Tri-County Health being able to do what they want to do, given that they're not elected, and also given the counties that are involved, I can also see politically why that creates a lot of problems. I see reckless authoritarianism of people who might be well-intentioned, but they're throwing darts in the dark. So liquor stores can stay open because they're essential. Um, pot store. shops can stay open because they were essential. Oh, listen, Cigar listen. shops couldn't. Now, who is making that call? I could buy a washer and dryer at Home Depot because that's essential in their big box store. But if I went down to uh, Factory uh, City or I forget what it's called, um, yeah. uh, I couldn't buy the same washer and dryer because they're not essential. No, this really quickly devolves into yeah, it's, the it's worst of politics. a little bit of ridiculousness. I get that. Um, but, you know, alcohol and marijuana, it, well, let's go back. Hancock announced his stay at home essential businesses, and alcohol and pot were not included. And before the press conference was over, um, I told my other half of Rosh, I'm like, we are going to Argonaut now. Yeah, I was there. And, I tell you, and when we got there, there was a line around the corner, oh. and it was mayhem. Within two hours, he said, okay, no, never mind, never mind. You can have That's alcohol and, and marijuana. And because smoking isn't as popular, you can't get a cigar. So, you know, to hell with principle. So if there's enough people at the liquor store, then we'll open that up. But there's not enough people at, at the uh, uh, tobacco shop. Or maybe there's more people at, uh, not enough people at the religious place. Maybe this um, uh, but, you know, place the, doesn't open. The fact that it's like... That's it's, political. It's, I know, it is political. The fact that it's a gray line that moves around, that's just that's part of what, it's part of what comes with this because you, you have to make some decisions. And you're going to make some decisions that don't make sense if it's truly about public health. But if you think about the may, there's not going to be mayhem because you can't get a cigar. 
if you were to say you can't go to liquor stores, it's like prohibition. People are going to be, you know, wandering around, selling it in the back alley, trying to figure out to get into a liquor store, or calling their best friend who owns a liquor store, hey, man, can I come in? I just need to get a couple bottles of vodka. You know, because they're stressed. They're sitting at home. I mean, there are a few things you can do when you're at home. Sleep, clean, read. If you play a musical instrument, do that. Cook. Get and drunk. Drink, and drink. Or smoke a cigar, which you can't do. Or in some places like Michigan, you want to paint your house, but you can't go to the hardware store to buy paint because that's un not essential. Uh, it, it, it really boggles my mind how progressives aren't bothered by this. And, and uh, let me go a little further. It boggles my mind how many conservatives were okay with this. Right. That they were, they were happy with the authoritarian and we're going to shut down, even though we have now depression level unemployment and we can't afford what we're doing right now. Well, I think you have to be careful in assuming that the term progressive means everybody on the left. Or means a liberal. I've learned there's a big difference yeah, between yeah. progressives, in, in which are when evil we have the people like you, well, and liberals <laughs> who are good people who <laughs> believe in process and do, so, do process. So, you know, the ACLU type, the civil libertarians, which typically match in many instances with you, mm -hmm. That isn't necessarily progressive, because there are positions and things that they do that some progressives may not, may not agree with. Now, why the ACLU isn't saying something here, I don't know. Yeah, um, I'm wondering about it, because these were the guys who went to bat for neo-Nazis in Skokie, Illinois, because your right to peaceably assemble matters more than... than right, but, but, these are, but, but if, you're, if you're assembling in that type of situation, you're not... The mere existence of you being there and the fact that you could be carrying a virus and that virus could be spread to people unknowingly and then those people could die, that's a little bit different than some fascist rally. It's not like the old fascist rallies under Hitler where people actually died. Here, it's freedom of speech. They're Friend expressing what it is. Owns There's a, a difference. drive in theater which was closed. A drive in theater which cannot be opened uh, because of this. I've known people who. Which run is kind of crazy when you think about it. It's like it's like you know. Uh, I mean, you might say, yeah, it's kind of crazy, but it's like automatic her, physical distancing. Yeah, it's it's her livelihood. It's her employees' livelihood, um, and so more importantly, there's a right to do that. And so, uh, it. Mind so, you, so I'm, my, my, I, mind I, you, I, I'm so far on this side. I'm surprised how many conservatives disagree with me on this that none of this seemed to bother them. You know, ideological, then, I, ideologically, I get it, but I'd ask you this question. Are you willing to have an extra 10,000 people die because you allowed a certain classification of businesses, let's say restaurants, to be open too early? Or to be open the entire time? Mind you, I find it a false dichotomy, but I'll answer it. And the answer is absolutely. In that, um, the numbers that we hear and the way that the media uh, pumps this up as a, as a fear factor, um, there, this is like a Vietnam War. Well, you know, more people die slipping in their bathtub. Um, you know, we kill more people every year on the highways. That's a false dichotomy, too, right. though. But I mean, no, but it, I, what I'm saying you is you don't the slip numbers. and fall in your bathtub because somebody gave you something that forced you or you caused die you to on slip. highways because people do that, and we. And this is this kind of carnage has happened. We see that there have been uh, years where the flu has been this bad. We see that 98, uh, no, excuse me, 92 percent. The last statistic I saw of people who died were in high risk categories. This is the first time in history we've quarantined healthy people instead of quarantining well, it's, it, sick it's, people or quarantining those it's, who are It's most a false vulnerable. or incorrect assumption, and I fault some of the public health officials in the beginning for saying this. This isn't a just an older person's disease. And I say older, Agreed. John, because we're both getting older. But I said people you know, in you weaker can now, categories. I mean, there, there are higher, not as many, but it's close to the number of people that contract this and have died that are in their 40s and 50s. So to say that it's an old person's disease and you, should, you shouldn't be asking. I said it was people who are vulnerable. And listen, my parents are in their mid-80s. I have a son who's handicapped and he's vulnerable. I worry about this stuff, which is why we're very careful with what we do and how we do it. But he can't get the physical therapy he needs 
from the people who help him. Now that's ridiculous. Yeah, I would agree with you on right. that. Right, but beyond that, people have a right to travel. People have a right to freely associate. And what has scared me so much about this is the ease by which people have said, no, nah, that doesn't, doesn't matter, as if it wasn't even a consideration for most people. Fear is a powerful thing. Yes, I've fear noticed. Fear is a powerful thing. Let me go on with a little fear. Now that we're paying a lot of people more not to work than to work, uh, I know people in the restaurant business who are, can't get employees back now that they're starting to open up for good reasons. I'm fearful of the growth of money supply that I've, that's just skyrocketing. I'm yeah. fearful of an economy that you, you've just taken a you know, quarter of the year and wiped it all out. Uh, that after going into debt every, every administration going back to when I was a kid. This is, know, this this is, is even bad. close. This is even close. Yes. I, I, I mean, the deficit this, this last, the deficit this, where it stands today, I think it's like 1.2 trillion. I was reading, you know, some number this morning, which oh, is no, like... Oh, no, that was just, I mean, the last, uh, you know, what, $3 trillion in stimulus just this year. Um, you know what kills people? Poverty kills people. Economic devastation kills people. Well, if poverty kills people, then are you for Andrew Yang's proposal, let's give everybody a thousand bucks? No, because that's coming out of thin air as well. Although, if there, if there were, I'm willing to have that debate. That's not the point here. The point is that the cure here, or what we keep calling this cure, we've done it. We flattened the curve. We've got to open up as soon as possible. Otherwise, um, I believe the, the economic damage. Which is leads be me to, I think, yep. what the governor is doing is actually smart. You think about the first Democratic governor to say we should start reopening. Now, granted, it's very limited, but he is the first says something, you know, and this comes back to me, you know, he's owning it, not dancing around it. And it... Actually, I'm a little, I'm a little worried about that, in that he no longer owns it. It's now going down through the municipal socialism of all sorts of counties, Boulder, Tri-County Health, and so now you've got different counties doing different things. Churches oh, yeah. and, and ring, Jeffco. Ring, goes. ring, ring, table for one for local yeah. control. I thought you were a local control guy. There are areas where local control doesn't work. We don't have slavery by local control. That's why we have a constitutional republic for issues that are bigger than that. All right, all right. You give me that. All right, actually, let's, let's talk about, because let, let's dive into the politics of it. Legislature starts in... 26. 26. Yep, that's what they're saying now. Give me your top priorities uh, for them. Oh, what? budget finance. Budget, school finance, That's, those are the things that they need to do. And if you take a look at the $700 million of cuts that they've done now, because you know we have the $3.2, $3.3 .3 billion hole, the $800 million more that they have to do, and that has to come soon in terms of recommendations, you start going, because I was going through those this afternoon, department by department, there are a lot of specific statutory changes that are going to have to happen in order to do it. And where it really hits home, you know, in addition to school, you know, public education, school finance, that world, is transportation. All those efforts that have been done over the last few years to start getting at least some minor flow of revenue into transportation, you're seeing that just evaporate. Um, but to do all of that, they have to have statutory changes. And that isn't going to be an easy fight. I mean, you can stand up and say, oh, God, we have to do this because we have this hole. We have to fill this hole by doing this. Well, everyone's going to have nine different alternatives for whatever, you know, you're trying to fill. Say, well, no, don't. Don't, you know, dig that hole, dig that one. Um, so I think it's going to take up more time than they think. Now, I would also expect, though, that you'll see a package of bills that are non-controversial, arguably bipartisan, so they can feel like that they did something that's bipartisan through the legislature. What do you think it's going to be? That's a good question. You know, I mean, for, it, for, for me, simple thing saying that only elected officials can... Uh, use emergency orders so that there's there's some sort of check and balance. I'm that, with you there. That after a time period that there needs to be some sort of other check and balance that the governor just can't do these things without the legislature giving the okay. Be right, because imagine if we had a Trump as governor and not and a someday governor we will. And that's so. why you know, progressives ought to be scared about this no matter how much you like. I get that. You, you like uh, a polis. So there, there are those things that I think really need to happen. Now's the time, especially if there's a... It's not going to happen, though. But there, if there's another flare-up in the fall, 
don't we want to be prepared for this stuff? Oh, and by the way, changing back to 120 days, just like we meant it, would be nice too. Uh, but, and I agree with that. I mean, it's, it's, the Constitution says 120 days. Um, and it's clear it's been 120 days, and there was a remedy for it. We're in yeah. the same place on that, so let's, we'll put that one to bed. Um, I think it would be, it's too, it's, it's unfortunate, it's too soon for, for folks, I think, to see the broader picture of do we really want to set kind of this unboundaried authority in terms of what an elected official can do when they classify something as an imminent public health threat. You know, it's kind of like in uh, contract law where, you know, it's force majeure, you know, an act of God. If an act of God happens, then the contract, you can, you can void the contract. And the entire time I was in law school and you would read about force majeure and you would read about act of God, you're like, when in the hell is that ever going to happen? And lo and behold, we're in a situation where you could argue that some of that has start to, you know, started to happen. I don't think it's sunk in about the need to at least put some standards in, some boundaries um, for what that authority can mean. What about the I mean, I'd be, I'd be all for it, all for it. Talk to me about um, family leave. Where, Boy. What's going to happen with this? So as I understand it, there's a family leave citizens initiative yeah. that could make it to the ballot or the legislature in their prolonged uh, slumber of a legislative session could do something. I don't think they're going to touch uh, it. I'd, I'll be straight before the legislature does something to refer it to the ballot on family. Really? Why? I, I, it's too controversial. It's it, it, getting everybody to agree. Um, now, maybe I'll have to go out and change my wardrobe and look awful. Um, but I just, it's hard. You know, we heterosexuals the, the do not fights, dress poorly. The fights, the fights that are going to come up, I, they don't have time for them. And I think a number of the groups on the farther left um, aren't willing to compromise in some areas that I think they need to in order to get something done. So I, I think politically we take that option off the table. The challenge then is doing petition signatures in this environment. And this comes down to the online petition signature, right. not dispute, but you know, are, are they going to try to do it or not? Um, if they were able to figure out a way to do it, I think they have a better shot of getting the tobacco tax on the ballot than they do family. All right, so for those who might not be following, because um, we're geeks, uh, in order to get something on the ballot, you have to collect about 125,000 valid signatures in a pretty short amount of time, which means petition gatherers go out and bother you at King Supers and ask you to sign these things, which is going to be a lot tougher with uh, the COVID scare. So the question is, does the governor or does the legislature do something to allow people to sign petitions online to make it easier? A lot of legal ha hassles with that. But whether they do or they don't, there's still a possibility that family leave ends up on the ballot. That's possible. In which That's case, possible. what does the governor do about it? Is he on? Is he off? Is he yes? Is he it's, no? It, where are most, I, where are I, most Democrats on it? I think that there's a challenge for anything that's on the ballot that's funding something that doesn't have to do with getting the state as close to being above water as you possibly can. Because anything else looks, even though as great as an idea may be, as something that, if, depending on what your political beliefs are, that you think needs to be done, I think it's really difficult to say with a straight face that, yeah, we really need to do this now, and we really need to fund this now, and we really need to have whoever's the one, because somebody's ox always gets scored a little bit and something like this. We're going to do that, even though we have a 3.2, 3.3 billion dollar hole, and we're going to have to cut out 10% of the state budget. And then you take a look at what we're at 15, 16% unemployment in Colorado right now. Uh, I think it's a hard sell. Now, saying that, it could happen. It could happen. I just don't, tobacco tax I see, I see the path, family, I don't. Path to it? Getting to the ballot. Getting to the ballot. Getting passed? I mean, uh, I, I, tobacco tax, again, Listen, this, people, people love beating up on smokers. We're, smokers are just easy to beat up But remember, on. the last tobacco tax lost. Only because the uh, tobacco lobby actually showed up. And they can't show up on each and every fight. So I don't know if they're going to show up on this one or not. Uh, but yeah, that was a beautiful thing. But it's like... Tourism taxes and hotel taxes and rental car taxes, that's on somebody else. And tobacco yeah. taxes are felt that way. Um, it's the easy whipping boy. Yeah, a, an employment tax uh, for family leave. Uh, that's a problem. That's a problem. That's a problem. Well, one on the tobacco tax. 
I would think, I'm not within the tobacco industry, but I would think that they want to start figuring out ways to get deals on this so they don't have to keep fighting these at the ballot every time. If there were an environment about fighting a tobacco tax where they thought that they could win, this is a pretty good environment because the argument is why in the heck should we ta be taxing anyone anymore right now when we have this hole in the budget that we need to figure out a way and so why should we, prior to figuring out where we can make cuts in state government, require people to pay more in taxes? whether that be people who smoke or people who don't. Now, is that going to prevail as an idea? I don't know. But to me, and the second thing about tobacco is they don't want this kind of trend to start. So I would think that this would be one that they would want to beat. Now, if they were able to come to an agreement where vape agrees to a number, tobacco agrees to a number, the health groups, from my perspective, no, the finally get realistic, as to what it could be, have the legislature refer it, and everybody says, hey, this is a good idea. If they say, everybody says, hey, it's a good idea, I still think it's a 50-50 shot, whether it passes, given the current environment. But why not give it a try? Talking about going to the ballot, um, why don't we get to the sexy stuff, which is the two big election issues, one being Trump. Yeah. And you know, I thought this was going to be a bad year for Trump in Colorado anyway, as it was two years ago. Um, I don't know. It will either be much worse or much better. I don't think it's going to be the same. Uh, and how that works will um, will dictate a lot of what happens with with Corey. Corey. Um, well, I think if you take handy, a look handicap at some of that for me. Yeah, if you take a look at Corey's numbers now, you know, being down double digits, um, I still think that there's a lot of the hangover from eighteen. Suburban women really, really do not like Trump. Um, I think, and I've said this before to you, I think, that Corey's, one of Corey's only paths to trying to win is, you know, he has to embrace Trump or not, uh, because he needs all those Republicans showing and up he to did. vote. And then, you know, whatever that survey or something that came out that said he was the third highest bipartisan elected official in Congress, which I think was rigged, but who knows, maybe it's true. Um, and it's a Luger Center named after Senator Luger, so maybe I shouldn't be trashing it. But if he can paint the, the conservatives finally believe that he's with Trump and then paint to the middle, oh, hey, but I really do work in a bipartisan way, then maybe he can increase his loss to single digits. I, I just don't see it. And I think, well, yeah. I think Trump is the one that kind of pulls him down. But for him to get his base out to even have a shot, he has to embrace Trump. There's, there's one part of that equation you're, you're missing, which is he's going to be running against perhaps Hickenlooper. One of the uh, most- He will be running. You, you, you're, you're certain about that? Yeah. All right. Uh, which is odd because I'm surprised- I love Andrew. I love Andrew, I'm surprised but I just don't Andrew, see it happening. I, I'm surprised Andrew hasn't landed more punches. He hasn't, I, I think there is a lot of energy for Romanoff. I mean, he's an amazing guy and he's an energetic guy, but he hasn't been able to, to, to land a punch. And it's partly because the media it's hasn't the, helped him. It's the context of time. The media hasn't helped him. I think it, within democratic politics, I think there's a certain, oh my God, let's do whatever we know. Right, right now, we really think we're going to win. And whoever that person is, that's who we're going to take. And I don't mean that as a criticism of John. I just think that's the environment that we're in. So on my side of the aisle, the thinking is, wouldn't it be great if Andrew, uh, uh, the Bernieite, uh, would win the uh, primary, it would be so much easier to, for, to, to beat him. I disagree in that I see in John Hickenlooper a tired politician who doesn't really want the job, and it shows with every misstep he makes. I mean, he's a lucky guy. He's a lucky guy that COVID has happened and taken the, right. the spotlight off of him. He's been a lucky guy that the media has um, um, been eating out of his palm for, for uh, 16 years. But still, he's tired. He doesn't want this job. Tell me you are convinced that John Hickenlooper really wants to be the senator. Um, I think he wants to have this job now. Now, it's kind of hard to say that he didn't back when he was saying, and I mean, I can't like say something that's not the truth. When he when, said, when it's on I'm tape. not cut out to be a senator. Well, oh, no, 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 no. It, it, was, it was clear in that, and that was, I don't want this job, and if I had it, I would suck. Um, However, that was then. This is now. This is now when he the said Senate's to within, the media, within real shooting distance for Democrats. 
should um, be protecting me. You know, I get it, but there's something about Colorado middle voters. That are going to like John. That also liked Corey. That Corey uh, uh, is one of the few really likable Republicans That's out true. there. That's true. This guy is affable. He's smiling. Yeah. He's funny. You always want to have energetic. a drink with them. Yeah, you do. And um, I've known him. I've known him for twenty years or something. He, he's kind of what you what you see is what you get. You get it. He doesn't have the same anger management problems that Hick and Looper somehow has been able to keep in his closet for sixteen years. But you know it better than anybody else. Don't even give me that look. You can go ahead and say it. And the stories of his anger management have never come out. Other stories haven't come out. But more importantly, he just doesn't come across as a guy who really wants this gig. Well, see, I, I think in this moment in time, I would disagree. And I also think the other thing that people are, or many people are attracted to John, one, he's affable. You want to be around him. You want to have a beer with him. But also, he can take a hard line. And say no. This is what we're going to do. This is position. When the we're hell does take. he take a hard line? I, mean, I think I, I think this whole anger management could... thing is more about that than it is anger management. No, I. There was he couldn't he couldn't <laughs> veto a bill all of 2013. He couldn't stand up to his own party. You, you know it better than most that this is a guy who better have some really good lieutenants around him because I don't think he likes being disliked. He doesn't like making tough calls. But that's not part of running for office. Part of running for office is an energetic guy you want to get to know. We know John Hickenlooper. Believe it or not, even though he's been senator for six years, so many new people and a media that doesn't cover anybody but the governor and the mayor here, Corey's still pretty unknown. And well, listen, he can you come can, across you, as a you, pretty you, fa fresh you, face. You can't not put some of the blame on Corey for that. For Of what? For not having the type of coverage and take, oh, no, some, no, no, take, some, take some bolder positions. You know, no, again, I, I would have a beer with Corey tomorrow, but he has danced around. Is he going to be with Trump, not be with Trump? You know this. You hang around with some conservatives. I mean, there's a whole group of people who I think won't vote for him. Trump came out. Because they don't think he's conservative enough. And they're going to vote for who else? They're going to come out and vote for Trump, but not vote for the guy that Trump says. Well, see, he's your party for? is the one. Remember, we've talked about this before. You're more about being right than about winning. That's more true. about winning than being right. Sadly, I'll, I'm going to take that criticism. All I'm saying is, when it comes down to Romanov or Hickenlooper, believe it or not, I'm one of those in the minority that think Hickenlooper will be easier to beat. Well, I will say this about John, and that is the governor. He has to be really careful because many times what goes through his mind, his brain, comes out of his mouth. Um, and you have to be careful about that. Now, to me, that shows uh, someone who's genuine, who's authentic, um, but running to be in the United States Senate is something you have, to watch out. you have to watch out for. And now we know that he thinks the press ought to protect him, and we also know he doesn't really want the gig. That was then. This That's is it. now. One of the interesting things about, you mentioned um, Trump. Trump lost by four or five points uh, here in Colorado, which was a much tighter call than when, um, um, oh my God, the last- McCain? Uh, uh, pardon me? McCain and Obama? No, McCain, and then before McCain, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, anyway, oh my God, the senator <laughs> no. from Utah. I'm blank. Romney, Romney, thank you over there, Romney. Thank you. Um, I was going to say that Mormon guy, but that would have been, <laughs> that would have just been rude. Anyway, so he did better each time the Republican is getting closer to winning on the presidential race yeah. here in Colorado, which means potentially in Trump's third election, he will carry the state of Colorado. Okay. One, that's not going to happen. Um, I have a difficult time seeing whatever path there is. Well, you just get rid you of know, that. You, you, just have, you should have another glass of Scott's Scott. John and just like come up with some more political the predictions. Point being, However, I will say this though. I will say this. I think Trump is underestimated. We've talked about this before. Yep. Um, I think he's going to win in a lot of places that people aren't suspecting. Uh, part of his appeal is the fact Trump is Trump. He may say some things that for people in my world we find offensive. Oh my God, he's burning the Constitution. This is so. Like not what the norm of what society should be. Putting the constitution and meanwhile, over COVID, and meanwhile, however, is in okay. you know, in middle America, in a lot of places that you know folks weren't voting, in a lot of blue collar America, they see that as my God, he's finally challenging the system and he's doing something. 
and you, you know, put aside, you know, the craziness and how he acts, and you, t you take a look at accomplishments that he's made from a conservative's viewpoint, he's done more for the conservative movement in terms of policy change that they've wanted than all of the Republican presidents combined since Ronald Reagan. If he gets a second... It's Heritage Foundation's wet dream. If he gets a second term, he might be more impactful for lowering the um, regulatory state and opening up free markets than Reagan was. But getting back to the point... I don't like that, but I agree with you. Getting back to the point, if, if, um, if he does better in Colorado than he did four years ago, he Trump, it's only going to help Corey more. And I think there's a good chance of that. Trump was a lot scarier four years ago when, if elected president, there would definitely be a war with Korea. There would definitely, uh, he'd be impeached. Definitely this, definitely that. And even people like me who reluctantly voted for Trump um, will now not reluctantly vote for Trump. I will vote for him proudly, uh, given all the craziness yeah. and all the weirdness. Yeah, uh, everybody's desensitized. Right. So. And so... If if grab five him there, point, go ahead. We don't care. If the if the five point loss turns into a three point or a two point loss in Colorado, no, I see your point. It, I see your point. It, it, it only makes it better but for see, Corey. I, I, well, I guess what I'm saying is, people that, who that say assumes, this 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 election is over, I think they're wrong. Yeah. Well, that assumes though that the Republican base for Trump is when they go in, going to all vote for Corey, and I'm not convinced of that. I think there are going to be some who just don't vote. I think there's, going to, be, I think there's going to be some drop-off from Republicans with Corey. Perhaps, but there might be some drop-off. It's just because of the environment that he's in. It's right. not that Corey necessarily did something wrong. Right. And that, that Corey's not going to have a primary. Not having a primary. Let's think about this for a second. That's bad. Yeah, it's great. For the first time, we're not going to uh, Dan Mays this situation. And, and we love that, by the way. Yeah, I know you loved it. Uh, well, you made it happen, so you should love it. The going into a general election with $27,000 in your account? Hey, <laughs> that's a winning plan. A, hey, we got, Republicans got 11% of the vote that year. And so I'm, <laughs> um, point being. Thank you, Tom Tancredo. Point being that there are going to be some people on the left who might not be voting for Hick as well because he's not quite socialist enough. This is a guy who drank... Socialist, really? Come on. Yes, socialist enough that this is a guy... Just because you're liberal, just because you're progressive like me, doesn't mean you're a socialist. No, but if you like Bernie, yeah, then you're a socialist. Yeah. So there'll be those who are... Do I sit around and say all of business should be nationalized? No. No, but the people you hang out with do. Let's get back to my point. There are I hang people, out with more conservatives than I do liberals, but... That's, that's only because another you're a lobbyist and you know where the money is. <laughs> if... Um, there are going to be people who would have voted for Romanoff, who's not going to vote for a capitalistic guy who said he was proud to be a capitalist, who drank fracking fluid uh, and supported uh, the evil oil and gas industry, who was part of that. So there's going to be drop-off on both sides. Well, by the way, point. just as a little side note, I have a bottle at home that I put scotch in that was given to me uh, by a CEO of an oil and gas company that unfortunately had to sell because of the environment, because I was doing some work with them. You sell and scotch? It's, and, no, it's printed frac fluid on the side, so I always fill it up. With frac fluid. Yeah, and then when people come over, I pour my scotch. And it's, so you and, it's, you it's, and John Hickenlooper. people may actually think that it's frac fluid. Um, I still think that there's such, I don't like using the word hatred because then it just it perpetuates yeah. something that's bad. Yeah, and that is the, the extraordinary dislike of the sides of each other. I think the desire for Democrats to win, it's, you know, put up Mickey Mouse, and they're going to vote for Mickey Mouse. And I'm going to catch a lot of heck for saying that, um, but people want a change, particularly Democrats want a change. Yeah. My point exactly. Democrats want a change. Hickenlooper is anything but a change for Democrats in this state. Oh. All I'm saying is, those people who are writing off, uh, writing off this, this election for Corey, they're being premature. That being said, he's going, he's going to have now, to. I, I will give you this. I think it will be closer than some people believe. Yeah. Because right. Corey's really good. All right. Anything else we ought to be watching out for this, 
this session, which we don't know when it starts, we don't know when it ends. Oh, it'll start the 26th. They'll get in and out as, you know, as quick as they can. It's a challenge in terms of how you do voting with physical distancing, you know, how they're going to place people within chambers, probably have to put people you know, up in the galleries in order to vote. It's going to take some time. And people are going to want to get in and out. So I, I think that they're going to stick to the basics. You know, why get into, because if I were the Republicans and we start getting into these are the little pet things that we think that we need for an election, then I would just grind that place to a halt. Um, and then it looks like, gee whiz, they can't do anything, they can't do anything, and the Republicans point to Democrats and say, see, it was their fault. Taxpayer Bill of Rights has an odd little carve-out saying there can be an emergency tax passed by the legislature without vote of the people. If that then has to be approved the next election. But it has to be approved the now, next now election. Now, would that be this, this upcoming election or I the following one? I think it would have to be one? this upcoming election. Oh, wow. So there are those who say, if only we could get a handful of Republicans, we can raise taxes. Okay. I realize that that's a possibility. Remember, they're Republicans. Remember Caldera's first political axiom. <laughs> um, I, I just have a difficult time seeing that, that happen. I wouldn't want to go into this election saying that you raised, even, even though we have a $3.3 billion hole to fill, people out there, even though they don't realize that how deep these cuts are going to have to be, I don't think they believe that there isn't some fat that can be cut. And I think doing attacks outside, it, they're all pieces of tabor that you can reform. The one piece I don't think you could ever get reform is the fact that you had to vote on tax increases. Because you're literally, it's you as a person deciding to vote, or, well, you get to vote. Do I want more money out of my pocket and give it to government? Don't worry, the legislature and the courts have already taken care of that. You just call it a fee. And so that okay, part. Okay, that's a whole other show. That's so. a whole other show. Um, oh, I had it, and it was great, but the scotch made it go. If. If they're, um, uh, the backfilling of the legislature, here's my concern. If the feds backfill the states, I want to make sure that this money doesn't go into something that isn't COVID related. Lots of states want that money to backfill their upside down pensions. Right. We see that in Colorado. You yeah. especially see it in Illinois. You see it in New York. Give us money, yeah. print the money, give it to us. We'll backfill our pensions. Um, I'm, but isn't there an issue? I mean, money's fungible. I mean, there's, it's not like there's green money that says COVID on it and then money that says non-COVID on it. True, but there are spending priorities that are COVID-related, and there are those that are not. So if money goes into the pension funds again, uh, well, then but we know. There's, there's an argument, though, that it's not, isn't the fact that the economy collapsed and tax revenues have gone down, so government doesn't have as much revenue as they typically have ba to, to do basic functioning. That's COVID related. So the money should go for that. And I would think a large part of the $3.3 .3 billion is COVID related. I mean, remember back in December, you know, Legislative Council, were, they were predicting a surplus with $827 million that the General Assembly was gonna have extra in order to spend. Then it went to 27, in March, and now, you know, a month and a half, two months later, we're at $3.3 billion in the hole. That's a pretty steep decline. And you can't say that that's because of bad decision making on part of the state government. It, it's really hard not to say that that isn't COVID related. Um, fair point. The difference is that people with 401ks uh, are not getting bailed out. Yeah, I get they're, that. They're, you know, this is why the public pension system, I believe, is just morally wrong in that... Mm -hmm. This is your defined benefit, defined, defined contribution. contribution. Yeah. And also, it also shows that if we care about future workers, we need to switch people over in government to a defined contribution plan so that when government goes upside down, they still have something that's their own. You know, that's another hill that you guys can keep trying to run up that's vertical. Just... How about this one? Go we for just, it. Go for it. All I ask is spend a lot of money trying. All right. How about this one? How about we do one simple reform to the pensions? It's a simple reform. It feels like a setup. It's not a setup. Nobody can get their pension money before a regular person could get their Social Security money. The idea of people retiring at oh. 52 years old right. in Colorado with their 20, 25 years in. State service. That if it's 65 for me and it's gonna, it'll get bumped up, then it's 65 for somebody who works for government. Would you buy onto that one? Uh, personally, I would. 
and I'm going to catch a lot of hell for it. But and now on I that, will. We'll leave it there. Sounds good. All right. Hey, always good. Good talk. Oh, I'd love to be here. Right. Love to be here. Thank you. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button, too. You don't want to miss a single show.